Any other questions before we uh, uh, go ahead? Yes, the video is uploaded online. It's right in our calendar. Okay, anything else? So you know you want to get online Kappa. Make sure you can get online Kappa by tomorrow because your first assignment is due tomorrow. So I'll have office hours in case you haven't run into any problems. I'll have office hours tomorrow um, from 4 to 6. So our office hours will start tomorrow from 4 to 6 p.m. in 23 Illini Hall. So you can just stop by there if you have any. All that's due tomorrow is the bonus survey and the bonus review exercises. Uh, they're just old STAT 100 pre-lectures. They're kind of fun to do, and I really recommend everybody do them. So um, uh, any other? Um, so I'll be there if you have trouble getting online Kappa or if you just want to, if you want help with the pre-lectures or anything. So yes. Oh, it's on our website. It's what it's uh, where the TA, where the office hours always are. It's 23 Illini Hall. And it's in the basement of Illini Hall. It's a computer lab. And um, starting Monday, or well, Monday's Labor Day, but starting Tuesday, it will have lots of TAs to help you. And um, I'll be there from 4 to 6. Um, if, even if you went earlier, there might be people. But 4 to 6 is when the STAT 200 lab hours start. It's the same place that those of you who were in STAT 100, it's the same lab you were in last year, 23 Illini Hall, and all the same, most of the same TAs will be there. Okay, any other questions before we start? Okay, so where we left off last time was talking about these type 1 and type 2 errors. And um, the examples we gave on the previous page here when we filled out this chart, were just very, very basic, simple examples where you just have one alternative. The null hypothesis for these problems were, um, okay, the, um, like the last one we did, just to give you an example, the, what we were thinking about was uh, uh, whether somebody's guilty or not. So in the case that I talked about is the null is the person's innocent, Right? Nothing's going on here. The usual null, dull thing. In this case, uh, the person's innocent, and the alternative was they're guilty. So there's just one alternative. Or in the case of a diagnostic tests, did we talk about those, the diagnostic tests? Um, but in the case of a diagnostic test, like your first homework, um, or, uh, the null would be what? The null is that... Um, the null, when the null is true, excuse me, let me just make sure I got this right up here so you can see we're on page two. When the null is true, that's no effect. So that would be no disease if it was a diagnostic test. So what I mean is there's just one alternative. You have the disease or you don't. Null is you don't or you have the disease. Or you're guilty. That would be uh, the real effect. You know, the per it's an unusual effect. Or the null dull thing is you're just an ordinary innocent person, right? Or if it was a, um, what's another example of just um, when there's just one alternative. But most cases, like in the example we talked about with the online class versus the in-person class where you're trying to see two different teaching methods, it's not just that it worked or it didn't work. It's like how well does it work? There's all different levels that a drug or a treatment a teaching treatment or a drug can work. It can work a little bit, you know. You could be a difference of uh, ex uh, overall averages at the end of just a percent or two, or it could have a dramatic effect of, you know, um, increasing the percentage of A's from 20% to 60% of the time people got A's. So there's a whole range of alternatives. In most of the examples that we use, there's a huge range, and it's not just an all or nothing outcome that we're measuring. So when there's a whole range of, of alternatives, we have to pick a specific alternative to be able to calculate the probability of the type 2 error. So let's think about that, and that's what we're going to be doing today, is looking at how to do that. 
calculating the probability of a type 2 error. This is, starts on page 5, chapter 5. It's cal how to calculate the prob beta, which is the probability of a type 2 error for a particular alternative hypothesis. There's not just one here. There's a whole range of alternative hypotheses, and we're going to pick out a particular one, okay? And for a particular <coughs> alternative hypothesis. All right. So let's review a little bit. Um, first of all, let's just highlight this. This is how to calculate beta for a particular alternative hypothesis. Okay. Um, with um, when we specify with a known when we with a known, we'll just add this sample size n and set significance level alpha. All right, that will be more clear in a, later on what I mean. All right, so the probability of making a type one error that's called beta, and alpha is the probability of making a type one error, right? Um, what, what is it? Okay, so the probability of making a type 1 error, boy, I'm already getting you confused. <laughs> Sorry. Gosh. I am the klutziest person on the planet, and so when I have to be attached to all this equipment, I'm sorry. All right. So, anyways, so there's two types of errors. There's a type 1 and a type 2 error, right? And a type 1 error is the one we set. That's the probability. It's we call, what we call the false alarm. When nothing's going on, when nothing's going on, when it's just a null, when you think there's no disease, no effect, the teaching methods don't work, there's no difference between the online and the in-person, it's sort of the dull hypothesis, nothing. When that's going on, the type 1 error, also known as the significance level we set, is the probability, when that's true, that we're going to make a mistake and say, hey, the teaching, the, the, there is a fire, that, that uh, one method is better than the other, the drug did work, that there's something unusual, that there is an effect, right? That's a type 1 error, otherwise known as um, a significance level alpha or a p-value. It's known under all those things that you've had in STAT 100. That's the old stuff that if you've had STAT before, you know about that probably. Raise your hand if you have. I mean, don't you mostly know what a p-value, have you heard of a p-value or a significance level? Raise your hands. Go ahead. I want to make sure. Okay. That's the old stuff that we, we that's in STAT 100. What, now what I'm introducing is the type 2 error, which happens when? When the alternative is true. And here we're going to say when a particular, you have to specify a particular alternative you care about, and then you say, okay, then when when it really does work, and I'm giving you the very simplified example, when there is a fire, what's the probability that we will, that our, our test, that null cutoff that we set, will fail to detect it? We have one null cutoff. We have one cutoff. We're going to decide for um, the null or the alternative. That's what the cutoff does. And you're going to make a mistake. There's an overlap, right? We're not, there's uncertainty. So what we want, so we set one level. We'll set a cutoff at 5%. That's the usual one. And that's the probability that we're going to um, have a false alarm, that we're going to claim we discovered something new and we didn't, that the treatment worked, that the drug, you know, this, something different's happening, that there is a difference, uh, right? And then the other possibility is what? That uh, we could make another type of error. We could fail to reject the null. We could say, oh, we don't see anything here. One teaching method doesn't work better than the other. When it really does, we just failed to detect it. So that would be, in the intuitive example, that would be if there was a fire and we, f we didn't see it. We failed to detect it. So that, what, what I'm saying is um, we're moving away from that simplified scenario where there's just one alternative to where there's an array of alternatives and we have to specify one. And then we say, okay, given that we want to detect this big a difference, so if I want, let's say, we want to detect at least, uh, I don't know, 5% reduction in 
the rate of uh, you know, disease with some vaccine. We want to detect at least this, mu this much. Given that, then we say, what's the, uh, that would be our specified alternative, that we want to detect at least a, this effect size. And given that, then we can calculate, given our probability of the type 1 error being set at a certain level, like 5%, we can then calculate the probability of the, under that specific alternative, that probability of the type 2 error. Blah, 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 blah. Their words probably didn't make much of a difference. And don't worry, they don't, it's very hard to understand with words. But that's the scenario, and now you'll understand it better if we go through some examples and pictures. All right, so type 1 error called alpha. Okay, probability of type 2 error called beta, and that happens only when the alternative is true. This, the type 1 error, happens when the null is true. This happens when the alternative is true. Okay, now we have to pick out a specific alternative, right? We can't just say when the null is false because there's a whole range of alternative hypotheses. We have to set a particular value, a hypothesized, we have to hypothesize a particular value for the alternative, just like we do for the null, right? To figure out the probability of the type 2 error. So now the question is, how do we decide on this particular hypothesized value, okay? And here is, for example, if we're testing a flu vaccine, right? How big of a difference would that would matter to us? Let's say we usually, let's say usually 10% of the population gets the flu, all right? So, I mean, this is a real issue, right? Usually, let's say 10% of the people get the flu. Now, how much of a reduction in that rate would matter, right? Would we care to detect um, if we thought the vaccine only brought down the incidence to 9.5%? Would we even care about that? Or do we want to detect, do we care? How big a difference matters to us? This is a very subjective question. Um, if it's a mild flu, probably not. But what if it was a deadly flu? That would be what? From nine, what? Well, that would change from nine, per, from 10% to 9.5. So that's a 0.5% reduction. That sounds really small. But if it was in a population like the US of 300 million, that 0.5% would be 150,000 people. So that would save 150,000 lives if it was a deadly flu. So if it's a mild flu, we might not care. It depends on what you care about. How big, a, this is completely subjective. So you just have to decide on the difference, the smallest difference that matters to you. Of course, 100% reduction would matter to everybody. But you want to detect, it's hard to dis detect small effects. So you, want, you know, so you want to detect the smallest effect that's important to you. So that's how you decide on a specified alternative. So for example, when we're thinking about two different methods of teaching, we have to decide, do we care if it just makes a 1% difference in people's grades? Do we care? Would we actually, does it really matter to go to a lot of work on a teaching method? Maybe if it makes 2% difference? you know, raises people's score on the average like 2%, 3%. At what point do you want to invest money? And because um, these experiments and all this stuff is hard to do. And it's hard to implement all this stuff. So at what, how much of a difference do you care about? That's the alternative. All right? OK, because the smaller the difference, you know, it's harder to detect small differences. So you need bigger sample sizes. And that's what we're going, that's what this chapter is all about. And in planning any experiment, this is the single most important thing. As a consultant, as a statistical consultant, any company is going to want to make sure that you got this right because they don't want to invest a huge amount of money and have these, your numbers be wrong. So this, the idea is you want to know, given your sample size and so forth, what the probability of a type 2 error is. That's what we're going to get to. OK. It's called the power. You want a test that has enough power to detect the difference that the company or you or somebody cares about. So, they ha so OK, so first we're going to just start with this really simple example where we know the sample size already, and we're setting the significance level. And now how do we come up with it? All right, so let's see. So that's what I talked about here. I'm going to repeat what I just said. Significance tests only tell you whether or not a difference is likely to be due to chance not whether the difference is important. 
Sometimes there's only one clear alternative, like, um, you know, like we just talked about, guilty or innocent, or disease or cancer or not. So we have no choice to make. More often, when we choose an alternative, what we're doing is we're choosing the difference we think is big enough to be important to us. All right, so now, what do we do? This is the overall, and then we'll go through an example. This is the logic. It's a very simple logic. It's just a few lines long, but um, so we'll go over here, and then we'll do an example. All right, so to calculate beta and to do other po power calculations, like calculating n, what biggest sample size do you need to achieve a certain power, you have to draw two distributions two pro sampling distributions, two probability distributions. One when the null is true, and one when your specified alternative is true. Okay? Um, and then basically, this overlap region is, is the uncertainty. I mean, if, if you had two distributions and you, you were able to separate them enough, for whatever reason, you had very precise measuring of the, you know, uh, way to measure the evidence for one for the null or the alternative, and they were very far separated, then you really wouldn't need statistics to answer the question. You'd have great measuring devices, and you'd have them separated. Or if um, it was a really clear case where 100% of the people are cured by one drug and zero by the other. You don't need statistics to tell you which one worked. But in, when you have these ov overlapping distributions, right, what we're doing is you're saying, OK, we're setting this null cutoff somewhere. So this is when the null is true. You have this sampling distribution under the null. And then you have one under the alternative. And um, you say, OK, this is our null cutoff here. And you, this is the null cutoff set by the significance level, let's say it's alpha, whatever you decide to set that at. And what that does is set the area right here, which is the probability when the null is true of wrongly, this is your decision maker, this null cutoff, of wrongly deciding for the alternative. right? But then when the alternative is true, you have another probability distribution measuring the truth of the alternative. And then, that same null cutoff, you have one, you have one decision maker. You're making a decision this way or this way, and you're making mistake, mistakes both ways. You're going to make mistakes. This is un, it's an uncertain situation, so we have to weigh the probability of one type of mistake versus the probability of the other type of mistake. All right. So this is also a judgment call, depending on how serious a mistake it is. How serious it is to make. Uh, a mistake when the null is true. This is also um, a judgment call, and you set this, right? You set this, and the convention is to set it to 5%. And then what we're saying is if we set this to 5%, and um, we know the sample size, and we can figure out the standard error, which is the width of these curves, then all we want to do in this chapter is figure out the, 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 the area here, this area, the probability of the type 2 error. <clears throat> okay, so, so the basic idea that we're going to do, it's pretty simple, is to translate this distance between these two curves. So this is, this is the curve. This is our, right here we'll call, this is our specified value of H0, right? And this right here, right in the middle, will be our specified value under the alternative. I, sorry, I've been abbreviating it with a capital A, H sub A. All right, so you have two specified, you have a specified alternative. Like in the example I just gave you about the flu, this would be that the reduction um, between um, the, the, the vaccine had no reduction, did nothing, okay? So that would be, um, reductions equal to zero would be the null. I mean, in our example, the, the vaccine didn't work. And this right here would be this alternative. We'd have to specify the minimum difference that mattered to us. So this would be, oh, the vaccine reduced uh, the incidence of flu by, fact, by at least, I don't know, probably, let's say it was 2% or 
for whatever value. It's a specified value of all the, you know, anything more than zero. This is saying it's not doing anything. And we have a whole range, and we'd have to pick out the smallest one that we care about, depending on the type of flu and so forth. So we have these two hypothesized values. And they are in terms of actual units, the percent reduction. OK, these are units. But what we want to do is these, the shape of this distribution, these are the, when this is true, when the, when the vaccine is just a dud, just a sugar pill, or whatever you want to call it, just a dud completely, there's still going to be a distribution around this measuring how effective it was because we'd give half the people the vaccine, half the people not the vaccine, and even if you gave them a sugar pill, they're not going to all, the rate of disease between the two groups of, of contacting the flu is not going to be the same. There's random variation just by the luck of the draw, which people happen to get chosen to be in which group. So this, this is the random variation, right? around that measures it, measured by some standard error that depends on the sample size for sure. And uh, you know, the standard deviation of your populations. So and this one is also going to have a sam uh, when the, this is saying, okay, let's say they're really it does reduce it by the specified amount, this vaccine, you also have to have a sampling distribution around that. They might not be the same, but let's just say they might not be the same shape, but let's say I just drew them the same shape. All right, so now what you want to do is translate this distance right here in terms of actual units into a distance that corresponds to the shape of the curve, standard units, right? You want to you want to see, like if you say this is, well, we'll say let's this is a normal curve, so let's say this is a z-score of zero. Well, we want to see how far away we've got to get the z-score here. We have to see in standard units, this distance, this is in z-scores in standard units. The standard units will tell you, like if I tell you it's a 5% redu reduction or 10%, you don't know where on the curve it is. But if I tell you it's one standard error away, well, then you know exactly where it is. So this is in standard units. And this is in your actual units, your the units of the hypothesized values. I'll just call them actual units. And all we want to do is translate um, this right here. When you set this null cutoff, this distance right here is z alpha. And what we want to do now is, whoops, I drew it wrong. Gosh, I wish I had. I want to draw it right under the hypothesized value, so erase that. Sorry, guys. Just right under, OK? This right here is the alpha. Like, if that was 5%, this would be 1 point. If we set this at 5%, this, would be, this distance would be 1.65%. And then we just want to know that distance, right? And if we knew that distance, how far that hypothesis, <coughs> if this is 1.65 away or 2 away or whatever you set the alpha at, then you just want to know that distance. And then you can figure out that area. So um, this is beta, and this is alpha. And from here to here is z alpha, and from here to here is z beta. And together, it's the distance in z scores. And um, so, as, so it just relates it. So the basic idea is to translate the distance between the values of the test statistic for the null and alternative, called the effect size this right here. This is called the effect size, the distance you want to detect, right? That into, um, let's see. The basic idea is to translate the distance between the values of the test statistic for the null and the alternative, h naught and h0, into a distance between the z-scores. So into this distance, Right here, we'll call it a distance z distance, OK? Into a, um, and those are specified by your uh, type 1 and type 2 errors, and using the standard error as your conversion factor, right? So the idea is, here in STAT 100, we did this a zillion times. What we said was a z score was like your observed minus your expected over a standard error, right? So this is like the same thing. It's your observed, it's your, or your, um, 
it's the two values, whatever you want to call your, you would, what was another one we always always said, value minus average over standard deviation. That was a z-score. So it's, it's exactly the same thing. So I'm going to, I can write it that way. You can say this zd is equal to your um, value under the alternative minus the value under the null. So this is like value minus expected value over a standard error. That's the same thing. Okay, that's all we're doing. So once you get this z-score, we're breaking, that's the z-score between here and here, we're breaking it into two parts. And we know z-alpha, so we can solve for z-beta. So this would be your first step to get z-d. Your second step would be then to, now you know you want to find, so first you find z-d, now you want to find z-beta, right, which is going to be equal to z-d, minus z alpha, because together they equal zd. I'm putting absolute values because we're not, we're just looking at distances here. And then once you get that, once you've got um, this number here, well then you can find the middle area and you can find that tail. So that will lead you to finding the middle area, right? So you get the middle area, because you're going to look up that z beta, you'll look it up and you'll get You'll use table <coughs> to find middle area. And once you get the middle area, you can get the tail. I'm just going to get the middle area for that curve. You'll get this tail here. And then you'll find the type 2 error. All right. Now, that's the procedure. Let's do an example, and you'll see what I mean. OK, so if, if you didn't follow this at all, please don't worry. Because everyone learns, including myself, learns through examples. I just wanted to lay it out for you first, the, what we're, the structure of what we're doing. All right. So let's do an example. And this example comes, I made this up because, um, I made this up because it makes me happy to think about my granddaughter. So I've got to show you a picture of her. This is about telling whether it was doing a hypothesis test to see if my granddaughter is uh, a genius or not. <laughs> you know, like a statistical genius. It's just a fun example that makes me happy. All right? So the idea is, is she just guessing or on these yes, no stats questions I'm giving her, is she, like my son thinks, or her dad, or is she really have some special power? All right, so I want to show you a picture of her just to make me happy too. She's so cute. Okay, here she go. Here we go. Let's see if we can see her. Can we see her? Can we zoom in? She's really pretty. There she is. <laughs> Maybe she doesn't look like a genius, but uh, she's too laid back, right? But um, she's a lively little girl who has a lively mind, I think. All right, so that's her. She's three now in that picture. Okay. So, and she's completely bilingual, so I know she's good at that. Lots of kids are being raised bilingual these days, and so she's one of them. All right. Now, so I think my, I wrote this last year, so I think my two-year-old granddaughter, Talia, is a gifted statistician. To test that claim, I plan to ask her 100 true, false, Ellen, you know, you guys have got to say to me when I'm doing stuff like that, when it's, because there's an online class, right? So. They're going to be seeing this, and it's like, it's not on the screen. So just raise your hand, alert me, because I've been, I've been known to go through whole problems like that. And you guys are fine because you have it right in front of you, but just say move it down or move it up, okay? Yeah. Put the formula right here that we just went over. Sure. That one. Um, which do you want to do it? Which way do we want to do it? We want to do it as um, z. We'll do it as our z d equals, do you want to do, is this what you're asking for? Yeah, yeah. Uh, age alternative, and we're going to have that like that, minus absolute value, minus H not, right, divided by the standard error. Now this is assuming that, and this, what is this C? So we're going to get that first. That's going to be step one. And then step two is what are we going to do? We're going to, we know this ZD is equal to Z alpha plus z beta. I'm also putting these, just make sure they're always, you know, they're always positive. Just remember, because we just care about distances. 
That's what C beta. And then that step two is to get this Z beta. And then step three is to get beta. OK. We want to get Z beta, and we'll, it's very easy. If we know these two things, this is second grade, right? Let's say this was one and this is three, then we know that one's two. So once we got Z beta, then we're going to get to our next step, which is using the normal curve to get the middle area. OK? Is that what you wanted? All right, let's see if that works. Let's see if that works. OK, so let's start off. But there's a lot of steps before we get there. All right, I think my two-year-old granddaughter, Talia, is a gifted statistician. To test the claim, I plan to ask her 100 true false stats questions. The null hypothesis is that she's randomly guessing. Under the null, you'd expect her to be correct what? Look, I'm, I'm, my, this is really how it's working. It's like I'll ask her a question about the null or just these questions, and um, probability questions, and she'll say, do you think that's, I'll say, do you think that's true, Talia? And she'll say yes or no. She likes doing this. I like doing this, okay? But when she gets more, when she gets a bunch of them correct, I say, look, she knows them. And her dad says, are you kidding? She's guessing. So that's the probability model. The probability model is it's like, it's no different than what? Reaching into a box that has a ticket that says true and false. But instead of true and false, the way we set these probability models up, we say we're counting the number of rights she has. So the true would be one right, and the false would be zero. So it translates into a super easy probability model. So the null hypothesis, let's say my son's hypothesis, Ellen, she's just guessing, right? It's like reaching into this box. Each time you ask her a stats question, it's reaching into this box with 50% ones and 50% zeros. And you're thinking she's doing better than 50%, but it's just luck of the draw when she does. OK? So let's say I say, OK, I'm going to set up a hypo I'll, let's set up a real significance test. Let's do it. Let's do it. Pretend I said that, OK? And we're going to get it. We're going to do this. So I'll have her. I'll give her 100 questions. So that's n is our sample size equals 100, right? And you think, under the null, let's just you say that um, uh, it's just like reaching into this box each time, true, false, and has nothing to do with her brain, right? She just reaches in and gets an answer. And so now she'd do it, which she'd reach into this box. Each time she'd have to replace the ticket. So be with replacement. Randomly drawing from this box 100 times with replacements. Isn't that the situation if she was just guessing? You understand? Whoa. Well, you understand? Isn't that the situation? Everybody, yeah? You all with me. OK, so that's the idea. So now, what, what's the next step? I'm taking you from square, from the total basic stuff up through this problem. So think about what you would, what's our, my next step, OK? So think about what you would expect to get if you randomly sampled from the null box. In other words, what is the sampling distribution of the percent correct that you'd get correct under the null hypothesis? And then you should set the significance level at um, alpha equals 5% and find the critical value, which we would be what, either 2 or 1.65. But we'll find it, depending on if I have a alt. We'll think about what makes sense. All right? So let's just go through this. All right. So what do we know? We know right in the middle, she could get either, we expect her to get how many correct? If she did this, the expected value would be 50%, right? Right in the middle. That translates into. A z-score, this is a z, and this is in terms of, this is the actual values, her percent correct, and these are <coughs> the z-scores. That translates into zero. All right. Now, what do I think? I have to think about, first of all, what do I really believe? My specified, I said here, I believe she can correctly, look, she wasn't getting them. I think she was getting them right about 60% of the time, all right? So it would be great if she was getting them right 100% of the time, but I wouldn't have to do a significance test. She'd be here teaching the class instead of me, right? She'd be amazing. That would be so cute. Can you imagine? I'd take her on tour. I'd be rich. But um, no, you know, it's like about 60%, I think. That's the, you know, 
Yeah. Now, if it was only like 51%, would I care? No. But I think 60%, like it's the smallest I care about, right? I think it's a real effect. And I think she can do about 60% of the time. All right. So <coughs> my question is, like, what's the sampling distribution here? Where is 60%? How, far, how weird would that be? Like, if we decided to put 5% in the tail here, would I pass the significance test, the null cutoff? Would I? Or not? That's... So I have to figure out what the, what's called the standard error is. What's the typical variation? When you, when you take 100 tickets at random out of here with replacement, you'd ex expect to get 50%. But how likely is that 60%? Is it like right here? Is it right here? Where? Well, that, you have, to, you have to find out what the typical, what the standard error is. So that's what we have to do right now. So we have to get the standard error of the percent. So we know it's expected values here, but we have to figure out the standard error. So, and that's, to answer your question, that's this right there. That's what we have to get. Because so far, we have, if you want to do this on a, just keep track of it, we can take a separate sheet of paper and say, OK, where are we here? We want to get this right now. Well, we haven't even gotten the, alter the alternative yet. Do you want to, let's set that up. So this is. Let's just write those down so we can translate it. Very good idea. Thank you for doing that. OK, so let's write these down, see where we are so far. So the H0 is going to be what? That, um, that percent correct, we'll just call it percent correct, equals 50%. So we've got that. And then when the alternative is true, well, our alternative, we decided to set it because I think here's when the, under the null, so that's our null. OK, but I believe she can answer 60%. OK, so I'll set that as my alternative. All right, so we've got those two things. So the alternative is going to be the percent correct equals 60%. So in terms of this right here, I'll just write it here so we know where. So I'm going to get, I'm going to say z, the distance, is they're both positive, so it's OK. 60% minus 50%. You just want a distance here so you can keep it positive. Divided by the standard error. So I have to get the standard error. So I have to get standard error. OK? That's where I am. So get the standard error. Now, in your homework problem, and a lot of times I'm going to give you the standard error, but um, standard deviation, but, I, but I'm not, or the standard deviation. But this one we can calculate, all right? I'm going to give you the standard. So, so what is the standard error? Well, let's remember the standard error for a percent, like for the 0, 1 box. The standard error for the average or for a percent is always SD, the standard deviation of the box, divided by the square root of the sample size. It's always that. Now, for a percent, that would give us a decimal, right? So we want to change it to a percent. like. We want to change 0.5 to 50% or 0.2 to 20% because we're in percents here. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to multiply by 100% to change it. All right, so we know the denominator is 100. Now, you might forget how to take the standard deviation of a 0, 1 box like that, but I'm just going to give it to you now so we don't get distracted. It's going to be the square root of the fraction or the percent in the, of the box that has this one on the ticket times the percentage that has zero on it. So it's going to be times 0. 0.5 times 0. 0.5. Those of you who are in STAT 100 also know that since the values on these tickets are just 1 and 0, it's 1 minus 0, so we can ignore that. All right, so that is our formula. But if you've seen it in a different way, and I'm sure you have if you had a different stats class, I'm going to say C page 255, I believe. Let me just make sure. I'm trying to use regular notation. And you all know this You've just if you've had a stats class. So you can look back here. I think it's, yes, right here. So um, the square root, the standard deviation is a square for percentage problems. It's the square root of p times 1 minus p, square root of pq. And then you're going to divide by the square root of n because it's a standard error, not a standard deviation. But the standard deviation is right here. And this is all the um, standard notation. So this is all we're doing. OK? 
50-50. So we get that. Go back here, see page 255. And what is that? Whoops, times 100%. And when you do that, you get 5%. Okay, so that's our standard error. So what does that mean? That means the typical, in terms of z-scores, here's one standard error, two standard errors, three standard errors. And here's negative one, negative two, and negative three. And like we talked about before, about 68% of the curve on a normal curve lies between one and negative one. But that's, those are in standard. Well, now we know that one of these standard errors in this problem is 5%. So this is going to look like this, 55%, 60%, and 65%, 45%, 40%, and 35%. So now I see, oh, pretty good. I'm pretty far out on that normal curve. You know, she's pretty far out. Maybe if, a, if she really can answer it 60% of the time, maybe I'm, in, maybe I'm gonna win this bet, all right? So, but in terms of what we're doing here, where are we at? So we got the standard error for percent, and we said it's SD over the square root of N times 100%, and that was 0.5, how did we do it? square root of 0.5 times 0.5 over the square root of 100 times 100%, and we said it's 5%. So we're cooking here. We've got what? 10 divided by 2, so divided by 5, right? 10% divided by 5%, so that is 2. Thank you for doing this. This is a nice way to do it. So we know in terms of standard, we know we can jump down. Let's write it on here for the people at home, too. Why don't we write this? So let's write it right here. So we have ZD equals OK. So actually, we did it intuitively. All we're saying right here is that this hypothesized difference, in this case, just matched up, and we didn't even have to use the formula. You can see it by intuition that it's two standard errors is what we're talking about. OK? All right? But so now we have to say, think about what you would expect. In other words, what's this? We did that. Set the significance level. So we have to find the cutoff point. Do you remember how to do that? So what is the significance level? So let's write it here. Set alpha, that's the significance level. To usually it's written as, so that's 5%. That means 5% in either two tails, which would be 2.5 in each, or 5% in one tail. Which should we do? Well, that depends on the alternative. Hmm. I'm just saying that I know she's going in this direction. The girl is not going in that direction. So I know ahead of time something. If I just thought she was either, either a gene really, really smart or anti-smart, like she, had, she sometimes got her sign wrong, she just never got around 50%. She knows something, but sometimes she'd be up high and sometimes she'd be down low you know, that she was either one or the other, but she wasn't just guessing, she was doing something unusual, then I would have a two-sided Z. But I think she's getting it right most of the time. Do you see what I mean? So I want, so that 5% I can specify ahead of time is in this tail. And my alternative here is just that, not just that the percent correct is greater, either greater than 60%, or lower than 40% or something like that, I think it's that it's greater than or equal to 60%. If it was a two-sided, you'd have to say it was either greater than this amount, greater or lower. You see what I mean? It's on one extreme or the other. Like with a drug that often happens, you might think, oh, the drug's definitely going to do something. We just don't know if it's going to be really good or really bad. You know, and then you would have the two-sided. But if you think, 
that it's just going to be good, it's going to be an improvement, then you can do the one-sided. All right, so that means the 5% is all in one tail. And so we want 5% in here. So now, if we know, how can we then get the z value? Well, 5%, we have to, to OK, to get, to get the z, the course, the, what's called the critical value of z, corresponding to alpha equal to 0 0.05, that's what it's called, you have to look. You have to either use a table, but in our case, we're just going to look at a normal curve, and that's the curve you'll have at the back of the book. It's the same one you used in STAT 100. You have to look on table. OK? So, so what we have to think, this is what you have to think. What, all right. So we want the z-score corresponding to that. So let's look at the table that we're going to be using and see how we can figure this out. And this is a table that would be on your exams. So where'd they put it here? OK, so this is what it looks like. All right, so let's go closer. And <clears throat> we want 5% in the tail. But you know what? These z-scores, these areas here, I'll write it here, these correspond to middle areas. And I think it's a very, very useful type of chart to learn because you'll, you really understand what's going on. And it really helps when we do something called confidence intervals, which you do a whole lot of. So the middle area, so for example, just to familiarize yourself with it, you see this one here? That says between 1 and negative 1 lies 68.27% of the area. And you see, when you have a z equals 2, this is both the positive and the negative it gives you. And this is saying, this gives you, this, this area here is the area between 2, between z and negative z, the middle area on the normal curve. So we have, what do we have? We have, we can write it in our notes here, we have, we know, We want, or in this situation, where we want to set a significance level where this area is 5%, and we want to know what z that is, z alpha. So how are we going to figure that out when we only have middle areas here? Well, it has to be completely symmetrical, right? This, we have to, if we know, I mean, the, this is completely symmetrical. So between, so make another uh, tail that's also 5%. And then this middle area that we should look up is what? What is it? 90, because it has to add up to 100. So we want to look up a middle area. Now, you know, on a, this is, we're just going to approximate. We're going to go to the closest line on the table, and we're going to say, OK, it's 1.65 between. So what we're saying is between 1.65 and negative 1.65 is 90%. So that's the critical value of z corresponding to a significance level of 5%, one tail. If I, do you want me to do the two-tail one now? Because it's not a two-tail example, but are you interested right now or not? Save it for when there is. I'll just say if it was 5% significance alpha in two tails, then it would, we'd have to go out to 2.5%. It would be, I'll just quickly do it. If it was a two-tail test, it's not, and alpha was set to 5%, then you'd say, OK, the 5% together has to be in two tails. So that would be 2.5 and 2.5, and that would be 95% in the middle. So then the alpha, you'd look up for 95%. And it's about 2. It's actually 1.96, but we've been just calling it. People usually often round to 2. So then you'd say it's between 2 and negative 2. It's actually 1 point. Do you understand? So this would be for the two-tail test. But we'll, we'll, we'll come to that later. Right now we're here. Does, this, does everybody understand? All right. So now we're going back here. And. Um, all right, so 1.65, that's kind of hard to draw, but I'll draw it right here. It's certainly, 
between, it's between one and two, a little bit closer to two. So this right here is Z alpha equal to 1.65, and this is our type one error. Okay, this is, all right, I think we've got everything down here. So you might just look at this and think, on first thought, I would think, whoa, um, out a little bit, that I think if she's 60%, then we are going to correctly reject the null, and I'll be right. I mean, if you, she's, she can achieve 60%. I'm pretty sure of it. I think that's where her brain, you know, she still has, she's, but I think, you know, she's not getting them all right, but let's say she averages 60%. Well, then I think I'm going to win the bet. But wait a minute. What I want to figure out is, remember, she's not, there's going to be a sampling, she's going to have random error around that, too. So... We have to draw another curve where the expected value, it's centered at 60, and then it might look something like this. Here's our type 1 error. But now we want to figure out the type 2 error, which would be if the, true, it, if the truth is that she really does average 60%, what's the probability that our null cutoff will fail to detect it and that um, we'll decide for, for, her, for, the, for the wrong way. We'll make a type 2 error. So I want to figure out the, the, per, the um, area under the curve there. So um, we can't just assume that it's exactly the same. In this case, we should calculate it. So, so what you want to do is say draw, set up another probability model when the alternative is true. So when the alternative is true, I think, yeah, there's random, you know, her brain is firing random. She's not a machine, or she, she's, you know, has all sorts of random stuff going on. So she's, but inside, the model is that she's got 60% of the time is getting the correct answer and uh, would be able to get the correct answer on average. And it looks more like this inside her brain. Okay, there's still all this random variation, but that's... Um, the alternative hypothesis is that um, it, I'm 60% of the time. So now I have to figure out a standard error. There might be different error bars around this. It's still going to have the shape of the normal curve, I should say, because of the um, central limit theorem, that with a large enough sample like this, the sampling distribution of the average and percent and sum follows the normal curve. So just thought I'd say that. So we'll do the same thing, standard error for the percent is equal to the standard deviation of this box, but now is the square root of the fraction of the tickets that have the 1 on it, or p, which is 0.6, times the fraction or percent that have the 0, which is 0.4. And again, it's 100 tickets, and is still 100 with replacement, and still times 100%. And now the thing about this is, is that there's only two there's only, these tickets only differ by one, one, zero. There's nothing, the sampling variation of this is going to be very similar. The square root of 0.55 right here, this is like the square root of 25, right? That's 0.5. Well, the square root of 0.6 times 0.4, think like the square root of 24, square root of 0.24. That's very close. It's just going to be a little bit smaller, like 0.49 or something. So why don't we just say it's about Everybody does this. It's a, I mean, it's not very different. It's very close. So, and if anything, we are being conservative. It's always going to be, it's going to be less because you're more sure she's going to pick one. It's going to be less variation, but it's 0.4, it's like 4.9 or 4.89 instead of 5%. So we're on the safe side just saying they're the same here, so we'll say it's 5%, which means that we can have the same exact we can use this formula that you like here. Otherwise, we'd have to use two separate ones. We'd have to go back. Sorry to be so careful here, but this is an advanced class, so I have to be. The w reason why I write it this way is because if there were two standard errors, you'd have to distribute this. And you'd have to say z alpha times 5% plus z beta times 4.9%. You'd have to come up with two different ones. But that's pretty, people don't usually do that. That's way for a way advanced class, but I'm just telling you how you would do it. 
I mean, this formula is good for both of them. You just have two different standard errors. But we couldn't then jump to this one where we divide by one number. That's all I'm saying. But here we can. And for all the examples in this class, we will. Just have the same standard error to keep things simple. All right, so now we can, um, so now we can do this and um, still use that formula. And let's see what we have to do. Draw both of them. If what's the chance of failing? To, so all we want to do, do you see what we're doing here? We have the 50%, the 60%. ZD is this. It's going from 0 to 2. This is 2. Put a 2 in there. We know that. We figured out ZD. That's ZD. I want to draw this nicely. Here's our cutoff from here all the way to here is ZD, and that's equal to 2, that distance right there. Now look at this null cutoff. We know, we already said that this right here, Z alpha, is equal to 1.65. Well, what does that mean? That means right here we drew the picture, just draw it down here, that from here to here is 1.65. So let's just draw that. So what we have is ZD is broken up into two pieces by the null cutoff. And from here to here is Z alpha equal to 1.65. And from here to there, from here to here, is Z beta. So you can see Z beta has to be what? 1.65 plus what? Equals 2. 0 0.35, right? So z beta is equal to 0 0.35, because it has to add up to 2. So we are right here. We got z beta. We can fill this in. We got that. So now you know this was 1 point, this was 2, 2 equals 1.65 plus z beta. So now we have z beta equals 0 0.35. Sorry, that's kind of messy there. I didn't plan on doing this, but that says z beta. All right, one point, and that's the 2. All right, we've got the 2, and now here we are. I think it's just easier to picture it this way. You'll see intuitively what this this is right here. Oh, we have the formula right here. I didn't have to do it. Now that I'm down here, this formula, it's right here. So we can just fill it in. Great. So we have our 60% <coughs> minus our 50% right there, and that's the 10%, is equal to, and then we got 1.65 plus z beta um, times we have that as what? That is 5. Oh, thank you. That was 5. So that's where we're at. And this is, let's, what, what are the units here? These two are units, these, these units that are percents of the, what, how well she's doing. And this one is pure units. So we're trying to get to these pure units here. And we did. We got to the pure units. So we got that this was 1.65 plus this one is 0. This is really what we wanted, this 0 0.35, right? Um, this was the 5%. That's the 2. See, the units cross out, and we've got 2. And this is, why did we want this? We wanted this because this is the whole thing we want. We want to find out, yeah, she's really far away here. But look, so when this is true, it's going to be unusual. But when this is true, look how close it is to here. I mean, this is a huge error. She could easily, even when this is true, and she really does have that ability, our test will fail to detect it because our standard error is too big. We don't have precise enough measuring. So let's just get that. You'll see how big our error is. You can see by the size of it. It's not 50%. It can never, you know, then it would be mean falling this way, but it's pretty, it's pretty big. It's too big for, so let's get it. So now how do we want to get that? Well, we've already, we're going to get it the same way as we got it before. What we want to do is, so now we know, so if z beta 
equals 0 0.35. Then the next thing we want to do is we want, even though it's, maybe I should put an absolute value because it's negative, but it doesn't matter. This, we want to find that middle area. So we have to use the table. We'll get the middle area, and then from the middle area, we can get the tail from the middle area. So we're going to use the table to get this. This is where the null cutoff is. So we're going to use the table, and this is z beta. OK, 0 0.35. It's negative, but that's OK. And that's going to give us this middle area, and then we can get that. And then once we, let's do it. So let's go to the table. All right. Now, it's, look, it's symmetrical. So it doesn't, that's why these, you know, doesn't matter whether, which side it's on. So we want z equals 3. Is that what we want? Is that right? So we want, can we just round to 27? Is that okay? Does anybody care? So we'll just go to 27 in the middle. If you have to do it more exactly on your homework, you, you can use another uh, calculator, p-value calculator, that's right on our website. All right, so we said this was 27. And now, 27% in the middle, so that would be what? 73% on both sides, is that right? So we just want together 73. We just want this one. So it would be 73 divided by 2. Is that correct? 73 divided by 2. So what is that? 36 and a half, is that right? Thank you. Okay, so then we get, um, so that is equal to, so then we'll say our beta is equal to 100 minus 27 divided by 2. All right? which is equal to 36 and a half. So we can put in beta equals 36.5. And that's our answer. Well, that's too, that's a pretty high beta. Like if you're, if you're trying to write a grant, and this is like the cutoff for the uh, significance le levels can conventionally 5%. And for some reason, they usually set the type, uh, the power here. The, the, at least 80% power, which would mean a type 2 error of 20% or less. So let's get our power, which is, so the, what is the power of the test? You want a high power. The power is equal to 100% minus beta. So that's equal to 100 minus 36.5. So that's equal to only 62, whoops, 63.5 power. percent power. Okay? That's not very high. So what we'd have to do is, what would we do if this was really going to be an experiment that you, we'd have to increase our sample size to narrow these errors. We have a few choices we could do. And this is on the next page, but let's just, I'm looking at the next page here. How can we decrease, this is on page 7, how can we decrease the likelihood of our type 2 error? And we'll consider some possibilities. And just looking here, I think it's easier to see. Um, the first one is this slider. We could slide it over. Why not just slide over our null cutoff and change it? That's our cutoff. Because what would be the problem with that? If we slid it over, we'd reduce the type, keeping everything else the same. If we slid this over, our decision maker, our null cutoff, what would happen to our type 1 error? it would increase. If we kept everything the same, there's a, you know, basically it's the alpha plus z beta is equal to the distance. You, you change one, you change the other. If you, if you keep your standard errors the same. Okay, so let's fill that in. So that's what it says. It says here, okay, so we can just draw the picture. The first thing is, it's a slightly different picture, sorry, but here's our, here we have a big type one, and there was our type two, and it says, 
um, what, you know, how can we decrease the likelihood of the type 2 error in basically um, decreasing type, decreasing type 2 increases type 1, assuming everything else is the same, and vice versa, of course. So just moving the slider is not going to help. Assuming all else is the same. Sure, you could change other stuff, too. All else is the same. OK, so now how about um, just slide the bottom histogram over? Let's see what that would mean. That would mean like sliding this over would mean changing our hypothesized alternative. So yeah, that would be great if I could slide it over to 65 or 70. Why not slide it over higher and then I'd really separate out the curves. That would be a big difference between your two hypotheses. And when there's a big difference, it's very easy to do a hypothesis test. You don't need a big sample size, of course, but the problem is if I thought, yeah, if I thought she was getting 65, 70, 80, I could do that. But it has to correspond to reality, right? You can't just slide it over if it doesn't, because then I'll, if her true ability is 60, it won't help me. So we can write that down. So your alternative hypothesis has to correspond to reality. You can't just arbitrarily slide it over. OK. So then the last thing is to do, what about if I increase n? What happens to the standard error? Let's think about it. Basically, the idea is if I increased n, and we're going to do this on the next page, but I'll give you a quick preview. If I increase this to 400, think what would happen. Put a 400 in there instead of a 100. What did you say? Yeah, it would decrease it by a factor. If I increase this by a factor of 4, square root of 4 is 2. So this would change. This would decrease. So instead of dividing by 10, I would instead, yes, yeah, so it would decrease it to what? I divide it by 2 to 2.5. So how would that could? Somebody's on, on the ball here. Thank you. So if I change that to 2.5 by putting 4 in there, then let's look down here, 2.5. So what would this be? Instead of going up by 5 for one standard error, I'd go up 2.5. So that would be 52.5, 55, um, 57.5, and 60 would be way out here. 60 would be way out here at 4 standard errors. So wouldn't that make a huge difference, sliding that all the way out to there? That's the way, an easy way to see it. Another easier way to see it, but that's an easy way for us to solve it, and that's how we're going to do it. But another easy way to see it is think about these curves getting narrower. Instead of being spread out this far, three standard errors, the whole curve, they'd be spread out. Th so they'd both get narrower, and there's less overlap. Do you understand? That's the same thing. So I drew it that way here. So this works. Increase n? Yes. So increasing n, um, I'll just write it here, increasing n lowers your error. Doesn't that make sense? More sample, bigger sample size, less error, more precision. This is your error, your standard error, more precision. So we have more precision, so we have greater greater precision, which means greater separation of the cur two curves. Less overlap. OK, so um, that's the idea. And the next example, which we'll do next time, is exactly what you, we just did in our heads.
We we'll just did that. It would be good to do it again next time. It's let's, uh, what if we increase it to 400 questions? And we'll just go through the same reasoning. Now, I just want to warn you one thing, OK? So you do have your homework that's due Monday before I see you next time. So number nine is like homework. This is like homework one, number two. And it's much, this is actually much easier. The standard deviation is given to you. Um, actually, do you want me to just? The standard deviation is given to you, and so you just explains how to figure out that standard error for the average. The percent one, we had to calculate. This one's much, the S, we had to calculate the SD. So this is actually an easier problem. So go through it the same way. You just don't have to calculate a standard deviation. Okay.